Live from the Hilton at Bonnet Creek, Orlando, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube, covering Vision 2015. Brought to you by IBM. And now your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. Welcome back to IBM Vision, everybody. I'm Dave Vellante with Jeff Frick. This is the Cube, Silicon Angle goes out to the events, we extract the signal from the noise. Mark Altshuler is here, he's the Vice President of Watson Analytics. Mark, it's good to see you again. Hey, nice to see you too. So thanks for coming on. A um, little different event here today, smaller but rich. Very focused on governance, risk, compliance, sales performance management, and the secret sauce, you know, the new shiny toy, the secret weapon, Watson Analytics. So. Tell us, let's start off, where does Watson Analytics fit in the IBM organization? Yeah, great. actually great question, get to ask this question often. Uh, so we of course have the Watson Group. Uh, we just had World of Watson a couple of weeks ago in New York. Lots and lots of press around this, dates back to the Jeopardy computer, uh, where we kind of first made our, our splash around Watson. Watson Analytics is really looking at the structured data aspect, so where you have rectangles of data, and you need to ingest those, you need to statistically interrogate those and kind of find key insights. So we're very, very focused on the numerical data side. Uh, Watson Group proper has a lot of their focus around the cognitive, unstructured data side. And then what we do is, or, or maybe I should back up here, how Watson Group views themselves is they kind of view themselves as the cognitive arms dealer across IBM. We're the first example within IBM of another IBM solution in another division that has actually consumed a large number of those cognitive services. We've put them in Watts Analytics so that you can interact with it in natural language. Uh, it learns as you go and it has those types of capabilities. So they're a strong partner of ours. We of course share the name with them. They focus more on the unstructured document ingestion. We focus very much on the structured data. So at what point did you personally get involved in, in Watson? So great question. Uh, this, uh, this conference actually marks my three year anniversary in IBM. Uh, I was part of an acquisition that actually is at this conference now, the Verison acquisition back in May of 2012. I was the co-founder of that company, so it was once upon a time four deaths in the basement, true basement startup, uh, very fast growing company and actually still here today, and it's renamed IBM Sales Performance Management. So, uh, part of that uh, in terms of this, this conference is, it's really the persona we're targeting, right? Like when we first kind of envisioned this and why we came up with it, it's around bringing it to line of business users, making something that they could consume, something that they could use, something that had the right user experience for them, something that they would understand, be able to share with their colleagues. So we're really looking to kind of democratize that skill set around analytics. Now, we do get into a lot of advanced concepts, but we want the users to get there as they're comfortable. So we allow them to continue to kind of peel back the onion, go deeper and deeper as they're comfortable. But at any point, if they want to pull up and say, oh wow, I've got an interesting insight there, absolutely fine, and, they, and they'll have that type of experience. Okay, so you're an entrepreneur, sort of startup guy, and you come into IBM, big company, your, your, comp your former company, got blue washed, you know, here we go, yep. boom. Now you're part of IBM and you see this really cool technology called Watson and you think, what, I can apply this to analytics? So talk a little bit more about How it came to yeah. be, yeah, sure. So we were based, we had a number of groups across analytics that were looking at data discovery, right? And how did we want to do a data discovery? And I've never been a me too person uh, the various solutions, customers would look at it. It was never a me too solution. It was always about doing something differentiated. And we were looking at this, but so were the Cognos BI folks. So were the SPSS modeler and stats folks. We were all looking at what was this next generation of kind of data discovery. And we saw an opportunity. There was this opportunity between data and visualization that we started playing around with kind of analytic discovery, smart data discovery. But this is the idea where you get a piece of data. Maybe you know that piece of data, but maybe you don't. And if you don't, then how do you actually know where to focus? And if you do, how do you keep your bias out of it, right? Like how often is someone's like, CRM pipeline win loss analysis. Uh, why do you win, why do you lose? Well, you talk to a VP of sales, they're going to have their theory. They're going to say, well, I win when I have a tenured rep, or I win when I'm in this market or whatever. And you end up, and I've done this before, you end up baking your bias into the visualizations. You create visualizations that back up your opinion. 
we looked at this and we said, you know what, there's this important step in between data visualization where you statistically interrogate the data for the user, show them things either that back up their assumptions going in or that strengthen their assumptions because yeah, rep tenure is probably part of it, but it's probably not the complete picture of why you win, why you lose, it's probably a number of factors. So we saw that opportunity and we looked across the three groups and we were all looking at it and this was actually a let's join forces and we're better together than separate type, type story. So Watson Analytics, the true story of Watson Analytics is it's as much about us disrupting ourselves as it is about us disrupting the market. We had multiple pieces of IP in the labs for many, many years. Uh, our predict IP had been sitting in the labs for about four years. Our cognitive discovery IP had been in the labs for three years. They were all going to come out as separate products. And we said, no, let's just make them one, one masterful data discovery, next generation, smart data discovery product. Okay, and it made sense, obviously, to put that in the analytics group, consuming the cognitive uh, services from, from Watson, and Correct. then building services and go to mark, going to market. And connectors to our existing technologies. We now have a Cognos BI connector. Those customers can attach directly. The Veris and crew on IBM Sales Performance Management announced their connector here at the conference, so they can now send data directly. And so we're getting really deeply integrated with all of our products. But again, you can use it with any product. It doesn't have to be our product. So I, I, I love talking to guys who started companies, sold them, and, it's, and then stayed with a large company and are innovating inside that large company. Conventional wisdom says that the large established players will get disrupted by the smaller players, but increasingly that's not happening. The rich get richer in this industry. You look around, yep. you know, um, with some exceptions, but generally speaking, the large established players seem to have cultivated this innovation culture through a combination of organic investment and, and acquisition. Um, is that a fair assessment and, and what's changed to I think it's a transformational assessment. Um, it's my personal opinion coming into IBM. One of the first things I brought to analytics was, you know what, we have to do fewer things better. Right, and we have a partner ecosystem that we can lean on. They can bring their solutions to market. There's always going to be great innovative startups. Let them cross the chasm. Maybe they'll become interesting technologies to us in the future as well. But we have to, we have to be willing to transform ourselves if we look at these technologies. And when I look at these types of things and kind of get focused on fewer things better, I use kind of a, a VC approach. Could I take this idea to a VC and would they fund them? And I was looking at a lot of ideas that would be brought forward where it's like, you know what? no one would fund this. Like it's just, I mean, you want to build something and then there's an addressable market of five. Market's right? too small or okay, right. Not scalable, not yeah. repeatable, too consulting oriented, you can't productize it. So now that we start putting this test to things and we look at technologies that have a true barrier to entry, again, maybe not permanent, but a multi-year head start that allows us to continue to deepen our capabilities as well. And, and the other, I think, fascinating thing, and just to go on a bit of a tangent is, what, one thing I've never done before, like I've done with Watts Analytics, is the amount of tooling we have under the cover. So we do a lot of observing around the user experience. What are they doing? What the experience they're having? Where are they clicking? Where are they leaving the application? But not just where are they leaving the application, like where are they going to next? And so the amount of information we learn just about how people are losing the product so that we can tune them continually. And this Watts Analytics, by the way, is a continuous delivery product. There's no version 1.0, there's no version 1.1, there's no version 2.0. We just continue to release new functionality all the time. So when did, when did you feel that you had the right combination of things to bring together to really have something different? It was almost immediate. Um, I had actually, I had been sitting in a conference where our data scientist in a box uh, product at the time called Catalyst was being presented and right away the light bulb went off. I didn't have my last role yet. I wasn't over all of the products yet. Uh, but I was running the performance management product, and I'm like, wait a minute, this thing, it really kind of goes through all of your data and finds everything that's interesting, but it was still a little bit off for me, right? Like it would say something like, this is an abnormally shaped bell curve, and that doesn't really talk to me as a business user. So a big part of this was, could we solve taking this stuff that had been historically data scientist oriented, and could we move it such that a line of business person could actually interpret it? And I'll tell you one of the funniest stories was, we had decided, and one of our marquee visuals is this bullseye spiral. And what we do is, you put your target in the middle, like I want to predict win-loss is the earlier example I used, and then you plot things against the spiral in terms of the strength of how they actually impact the spiral. So the closer to the spiral, the more predictive it is. So your statistical models are going to be closer, although we call it a combination for our users, and the key drivers are going to be further away. 
So I sat down with our, with our statistics folks and I described to them this concept how I want to do this circle of influence and plot things against the bullseye. And they're like, yeah, 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 that's great, that's great. And then I said, so what's the x-axis, what's the y-axis? And they look at me blankly, there's no x and y-axis in stats. <laughs> so just kind of taking this stuff, that was the first challenge is could we take something that historically gone after a very specific persona, deep data scientist, and could we make it consumable by, by others? When we had that breakthrough, we knew, so I always knew there was something there, but that was the kind of crossing our chasm moment was, could we make something that you and I would understand with me, I mean, with either no stats background or maybe one stats course in college or something like that. Right, I mean, that's right. about the, the level of knowledge you need. And then how important is the cognitive piece, the natural language piece, in terms of really opening up this as a, a UI for regular people to use. And we, we often talk at a lot of shows about kind of AG after Google. Yes. And, and the expected behavior of things once Google really got us all spoiled, that nothing should be more than a five word question away that comes back within seconds. So now that you guys can start to use that natural language ask, how has that really been a game changer? It, it's, I mean, in terms of getting people to their results quickly, like mm -hmm. if you think of what, it, what was it to do visualizations before natural language, it was grab a data range, choose a chart type, give it a title. This is effectively, give it a title, we'll pick the right set of data, we'll default, default to the best uh, visualization, we'll give you backup visualizations that also fit. We won't tease you with any visualizations that don't fit, unlike like if we do that in a spreadsheet where there's a little bit of trial and error, oh, that one fits, that one doesn't fit. We won't show you a visualization that doesn't fit your data. So it, it completely flipped the paradigm where it's like, you started the title of what you want to do, we'll fill out the rest, you tweak it, you tune it once we do that. And then what we also did with it was we moved it into this whole starting points paradigm. So even before you ask a question, we asked the data in natural language a whole series of questions and we surface the most interesting starting points to you before you even start. So if it's a new data set to you, we actually make suggestions. Why don't you start with one of these eight questions? If not, there's always a natural language bar there and you can type in your own question. But yeah, it's been, it's been transformative to so, people using so, this. So how many, I don't know, you said you get a lot of uh, feedback data on the use of the application. Typically, how many kind of question steps does somebody go through before they get to the, uh, you know, I'm parking yeah, uh -huh here moment. for a while. This is, this is good stuff. So it's at, it actually depends on what they're doing. If they're doing kind of your traditional kind of data discovery approach where I, I've just loaded in a data set and I want to ask my own questions, then they'll see some of our starting points. Sometimes those are right on the money, but typically they're after something that maybe wasn't the most significant thing in their data set, but they still wanted to ask questions about it. They'll ask their question about that, and usually immediately they ask that first question, they see it, then they might drill across, they might drill down. They might kind of do a little bit of slicing and dicing on it, but usually that first question right away, I mean, I remember we did a promo around the NFL playoffs uh, where we took a whole bunch of sports data and we loaded it in and we let people just get started with NFL player data. And, and I first started when we were playing with it, I started with last year's NFL stats. So not this past year, but the season before. And one of the questions was, um, which team had the most pass attempts? So if you think two years ago, you might think someone like a Denver, right? Peyton Manning was just winging it everywhere. And who was a really bad team that year? Cleveland. You know who had the most pass attempts? Cleveland. Really? Like, so it's like, so right away, time. you get right. something that's really interesting. Now, on right. the prediction side, you don't really have to know what to ask. We actually, you pick your target. You don't have to think of the question, though. Once you have your targets or multiple targets, we give you the profile or pattern of what drives every target automatically out of the box, and we give that, we feed that back to you in natural language. We give you a visualization plus a natural language string that explains it. Now that's really interesting because in the, you know, the early, we've been to tra to following the Hadoop movement and the early big data days, and, and the data scientists would always tell us early on, the hardest part is knowing which questions to ask. So you need to be really talented to be able to maybe hack some data before you could even figure out what questions to ask. Are you saying that you can actually compress that cycle and tell me what I should be asking? So you, you just teed up about it. I was, if you didn't go to that question, I was going to ask it for you. So it's a really interesting <laughs> point that you just stumbled onto. So what's the value proposition to a data scientist? Let's go to the other extreme. Can they use this tool? Is it too rudimentary for them? Will they not get anything interesting? So we had on stage here Jing Shear. She's our chief statistician, IBM fellow. She was on the, the main stage keynote. Uh, and she always, she, so she's the one, she's kind of the brainchild behind this, the, the multiple patterns, I think 15 plus patterns that, that go into this IP. Uh, she was working on this, she said on paper for about 15 years and they coded it for about four years after that. So it's, it's, it's absolutely immense IP. And 
to her, what she said where it speeds up for the data scientist is the data prep cycle. So what does she mean by that? She had gone out to one of the municipalities and, and had met with the mayor there, and the mayor wanted to know what drove a certain type, what was driving rental rates in different areas of the city, what were the true drivers of this. Uh, and there were also some questions in terms of crime and how it relates to rental rates. She spent two weeks with this data set just trying to figure out what mattered, right? And that's where data scientists will spend a lot of time is this whole trial and error of trying to figure out what makes up the model before they can tune the model. So for her, she put it in this IP within two minutes. She had that same thing that took her two weeks a few years ago out of the box. And so for a data scientist, what it does, it speeds up that whole find the model process and then you go and tune it. With one of the clients we've been, uh, we showcased in our professional release, uh, uh, press release, Legends Hospitality. They run the stadium operations for the Dallas Cowboys, the New York Yankees, uh, a, few other, uh, a few other stadiums. They were trying to figure out what drove a certain type of revenue per attendee, stand concessions, things like that. So he took it and he loaded it into Watts Analytics and right away out of the box he found a model with 82% predictor strength. He showed it to his colleague. His so what, is, what was he throwing in? What, what data set? He threw in, so he took, data he took in a whole stadium's information, all their concession information, their ticket information. Um, he said he, it was all in a single file, but he ingested it in, but it was really kind of all the information they collected. So they, they wouldn't necessarily have social demographic information other than just knowing the, the general nature of who may attend, but the more specific okay. kind of stadium-related information. They loaded in 82% predictive strength, high-level model, so right away, he shows his colleague, and his colleague starts laughing, and he's like, dude, weren't you trying to find that for six months? And he starts laughing, he's like, yes. <laughs> now, he couldn't finish there, right? He needed something that was more highly tuned, but he could start at that, and now he tuned it using his additional SPSS modeler products and your statistician products, and you tune it further. But so that time they were taking, I mean, I gave you Jing's example of a two-week example. There's a six-month example where they were just doing so much trial and error to figure out what this high level model was. It just gets you was. through that kind of basic wash, you through, if So you for will. every data scientist, this is an accelerator. Yeah. We, we run out of time, so we've got to let you plug your, uh, your announcements this week. So sure. what, are you, what are you announcing here at the show? And so per usual, we, do have, we, we have a free edition that's in the market. It's always been in the market, so I encourage anyone, go to watsanalytics.com, start with the free edition. Uh, about a month ago, we released, or actually a little less than a month ago, but mostly being announced here, we released our professional edition. This is our first enterprise level edition. It's the first edition that allows you to do multi-user. Um, it, it has additional data connectors like the Cognos connector I talked about, like the SPM connector. We continue through continuous delivery to add additional connectors in addition to the ones that are there. So that's a big announcement for that. Professional also allows larger file sizes uh, to be brought into Watson Analytics. Um, and then the other big thing that we announced here uh, is uh, a grant we've done to our BI customers to get them going of actual professional licenses. And then here at the conference, we told our TM1 and SBM customers that we were giving them Watts Analytics Professional as well for a 12-month term. And again, more details. People need to follow up with their reps or their advocates. But that was, the most, that was probably the biggest announcement we did is we said we're giving it to our customers. Excellent. So last question. Sure. Um, Binoculars, maybe not telescope. Put on the binoculars. What's okay. what's this world going to look like in a couple of years? I think uh, there's more analytical capabilities to come. Uh, we we've kind of hung our hat on the cognitive discovery and the predictive so far. Coming very shortly, our forecasting algorithms, so time series based forecasting algorithms. So we're very excited about that scoring capability. So. Maybe you are doing CRM pipeline and you know what the profile of a good lead is, so being able to apply that to new leads and get it to the right people when that comes in, that's something that's excited, exciting to us. So there's a lot of analytic capabilities that are coming in. There's a lot of also enterprise and scale capabilities that are coming in as well, a lot of integration with other IBM products. That would be kind of the, the 500 feet up type. Awesome. View. Mark Altschuler, you and your organization applying the, the greatness of IBM's cognitive services into real world examples. Thanks so much for coming on the uh, Cube and sharing. Hey, thanks so much for having me again. Hopefully we'll see you guys at Insight again. We'll be there. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest. This is the Cube. We're live from IBM Vision 2015 in Orlando. We'll be right back.